Welcome back to I Can Science That. We've had a few flat earthers appear on the channel so far, and in these interviews, I've gotten a sort of a pattern that they seem to mostly be focused on all the aspects of science that are out of reach of the common person. To that end, I would like to encourage them and all of us to really double down on embracing all the aspects of science that are available to the common person instead. Instead of focusing on all the things that are very hard to know or hard to understand or impossible to ever know for sure, let's do some observations like the solstice observations we did just, uh, just this month to find out where the sun is uh, on, on the June solstice. And that is what we've done. Um, how high is the sun? Well, that's the first thing we're going to investigate in the, in the previous video. I'll link it up there. We showed the raw data tonight. Let's take a look at interpreting that data in terms of the flat earth. If the earth is flat and the sun's circling above it, how high up is the sun? Now, this is something we can do using just very simple experiments, simple observations that are done just by regular people throughout the world. We got together and we did that observation and we're going to find out once and for all what is the true number. The first thing that we said we do is confirm that 111 kilometers per degree of latitude. So here's Google Earth. Uh, I've placed some markers to just help us find some, some places to measure. Where did I put some? Uh, some of our skeptics are in the, uh, the UK here, so I put some in the UK. Let's see. Let's align it north-south. I put some markers. These, I just did this to speed this process along. Now, if you want to seriously check this out, what you'll need to do is drive to specific landmarks, Maybe pick landmarks along the roadways and then drive along that. Use your odometer to verify that the distances given by Google Earth are accurate in your location. Um, what I'm going to do is see whether Google Earth agrees that everywhere on the, on the Earth that we get 111 kilometers per degree of latitude. So I place two markers on the same longitude line, two degrees west, and this one's at 55 degrees north, this one's at 51 degrees north, so that's four degrees apart. Let's just measure and get the distance. So, measurement tool. Uh, okay, let's just do a little clicky right there. So that's at, you can see the bottom corner here, 55 north, let's get it as close to 55 north, that's close enough. Okay, and then we'll come straight down to 51 north. And you can see in the corner that I'm not lying. It, it is where I said it is. And there's your distance, 444.76. 444.76 kilometers per four degrees. 111 degrees, uh, sorry, 111 kilometers per degree. So that's confirmed on that one. Um, let's go look. I got some in the U.S. Let's go look over in the West Coast here. Uh, okay. Here I have one at 34. And then up north, I dropped one at 39. And then further up, uh, one at 48. So we can do both sections here and see whether maybe anything changes as you go further north. So let's start up here at 48. We're going to go from 48 to 39. So how far is that, right? This is 48 minus 39. We're going 9 degrees on this first one. Okay, so we'll put our starting point here at 48. And then drop straight down to 39. That's good. Okay. 999.96.96 divided by 9, 111 kilometers per degree. Excellent confirmation there. Let's do the next one from here and down here in Los Angeles area. Try and get it right at 34. Boom. 
554.2. How many degrees was that? That was from 39 to 34, so that's five degrees. You divide by five, 111 kilometers per, per degree. So, okay. Um, where else did I do it? Some of our folks are uh, down south. Let's see if things are different down south. We are now at 151 degrees east, and I've got one up here at 24 south and one at 34 south. So this will be 10 degrees apart. Let's measure that distance. We'll go, I don't know, 20, we want 24 south, and we're going to go to 34 south. Uh, that's good enough. Okay, um, calculator. 1105.68 divided by 10. Okay, 111 kilometers per degree. Okay, so uh, that should give us confidence. We knocked that one off. If you have a different map besides this, check it on your map. But um, I think that we have confirmed at least Google Earth says that uh, each degree of latitude is consistently around 111 kilometers. So we can be confident with that scaling in our diagrams. The first result we wanted to look at was the flat earth sun height. So this whole thing is premised on the idea that the sun is circling above a flat earth, so it should be at the same height the entire day. In, uh, at least during, during a single day, it should stay at that same height. So we will triangulate what that height is based on these angles that we just measured. So before I showed the formula and stuff like that, um, I just put that formula right over here. Got a couple of, of instances of the formula right there. You can see it um, up in there. Uh, based on the distance, now the distance we're gonna get from the latitude, based on what we just saw from Google Earth, there's the formula right there. So uh, let's do some spot checks. Let's start, uh, I'm gonna say let's start up north let's start up in the in the great white north or something here um, we want to get a decent distance between our two measurement points so we're looking at for something more than five degrees apart and we want something with really low errors so I don't know let's take this one's really low error let's take this one uh, yeah we'll put that one in and uh, what, what, oh, here's one really low error. Let's put that one in. So that's from, and yeah, we'll see it right over here. So that's from 52 to 59. So that's, you know, seven degrees almost, seven degrees uh, of latitude. And using those two observations, we triangulate the flat earth sun height. The sun is 4,640 kilometers above the flat earth. There you go. We have the answer. Now we, we can say we officially know how high the sun is. And it's not just a guess. This is an actual measurement we did from actual observations. But before we do, let's, let's check it with a few other spots. Um, see if we get the same number. Let's go a little further south. Um, let's do one down by me. Uh, I'm in the 34 range. So let me get a good number down in there. Uh, this one, let's say, yeah, let's, let's get that one, 34.1. We'll put that in. And something higher, 40s. Here's a, here's a 44 with a really low error. Let's put that one in there. And okay, that's about 10 degrees apart. And according to those, We've got 5,700 kilometers. So it's not 4,600, it's 5,700. Hmm. Now there was some error. There was some definitely some error in these. So maybe that's just a little bit of sloppiness. Um, let's check another one. Let's go, let's go way south. We have some people down in the New Zealand, Australia area. They did some measurements. Let's see what they got. Um, they should be on these negative values. Oh, well, this first one is really good. Let's take that one. Yup, we got that one. And we'll need something higher than that with a good error. Ooh, look at that. 
Well, that's like dead on. We'll take that one. Okay, what did they get? They got 1460. So wait a minute. The sun is circling at the same altitude above the flat earth, right? Um, and when you measure how high that is, if you're up in the northern latitudes, you measure 4,600 kilometers. And then as you start coming down south a little bit, the sun appears to be higher. It's at 5,700 kilometers. But then when you go way down south, it drops again way down. Now it's only at, it's under 1,500 kilometers. Um, what gives? Let's do one more. Uh, I got four slots in here. I wanted to do one that is across the whole data set. So from the beginning to the end of the data set. Let's take a look at that. So the first element, and it's, it's a good one. We'll put that one in. And then we'll take the last element. And see, these are the, these are the most extremes. So this should give us like, you know, if there's maybe this wiggle in between, and it should give us the average. And it does. So it gives us uh, 3,500 kilometers up is the sun, according to that measurement. So this is, I don't need to tell you, that's a lot of variation. It's like a whole lot of variation. Um, and and it, it goes up and it goes down. Uh, so where is the sun? We were trying to measure why does this vary so much? So the first thing you might want to consider is, is there really 111 kilometers per degree of latitude? What else could it be? Um, could it be the error? The, the error, maybe it's experimental error, and, and these measurements just aren't all that accurate. But that's when we bring back to this curve, and we see how these measurements create a line. They create this straight line and that straight line tells us something. It tells us this was not an accident. Accidents are sporadic. They go every which way. But this is not an accident. This is a very straight line. Uh, so no, it's not coming down to experimental error. This is a little uh, a Python program that I wrote. I just knocked this out really fast so we could try to visualize these measurements um, and maybe by visualizing, we can understand what's happening better. So the blue area, this is the, the plane of the flat Earth. So right there, this is the flatness uh, of the surface. The, the gray line is the equator. So that's right over the equator. And this is the Tropic of Cancer. This is where the sun is supposed to be directly over that line at, at some point, right? So this is all done at noon. So at noon, if you were somewhere under this line, the sun was supposed to be straight up right then. So that, that should help us uh, see. This is a side view. So the sun is up here somewhere, and we think it's somewhere over that line. So what I'm going to do is go through our measurements one by one. I've got them sorted from south. South is over here on the left. North is over here on the right. I've got them sorted from south to north. Let's draw them one by one. So there's our first measurement from somebody in the south, and the, the, the angle of the green line shows the angle that the sun is somewhere along there. We think it's over this line, so we think that means the sun should be right about there. And, and as a first measurement, that looks good, that's reasonable. Um, let's go on. The second one, the yellow line, as we move a little bit further north, it looks like it's a little higher. But I made it yellow to indicate that there's more error on this measurement. So this is one degree off. This, this measurement was one degree off. And so maybe that's why it's shooting up a little higher than the other one. Let's keep going north and see what happens. Green. Green means that was an excellent measurement. It's within one degree of, uh, of error. But notice how it's continuing to shoot further up north. Uh, I'm sorry, it's continuing to shoot further higher in the sky along this line uh, of the, the, the subsolar point. Let's continue. We'll keep going north. As we take more measurements, we are getting a pattern here. The lines, as we go further north, the lines are tipping 
higher and higher, steeper and steeper, um, which we expect, but, the, but the, the cross of this line is getting higher and higher each time, um, which is a little fishy. How about the intersection between the lines? What we had talked about was, well, maybe the subsolar point is just completely wrong. Let's look down here. Down here is where those lines are crossing, and they, only, they do kind of cluster. They definitely seem to cluster in this area somewhere. But if we look a little closer, I think we'll see that that cluster is kind of large. Um, there's, there's crossings here. There are crossings here, and there are crossings over here. Um, so maybe this yellow line. Again, the yellow lines, they are the ones that have a degree of error. So we have to take that into consideration. What if I tilted those yellow ones back down by one degree? Would that bring them into, in, into line? Maybe this is the spot we should be looking for. And is one degree on those going to get them where we need them to go? Um, I, I think it might take a little more than that, but let's keep going. These are just our southern observations. If we keep going, we'll get into some northern ones. Let's see what we got. Hey, there, there's a northern one right there. I timed that perfect. So that one's a northern one, um, and it does not point anywhere near this cluster of intersections. It seems to cross the subsolar point way up here. Um, let's keep going. Okay, the red one, that means it's off by at least two degrees. So maybe we just disregard that one. Don't worry about that one. Here's some green ones. All right, this is better. We're getting, we're getting some something here. It looks like maybe the, the sun's going to be in this location. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, red one, we don't worry about that. But wait, what's happening now? As we go further north, now the point where it crosses the subsolar point is coming down. And it's going to keep doing that. Keep doing that as we go. Okay, and there's all of our measurements. There's the measurements visualized. Um, we had some in the southern hemisphere. We had some in the northern hemisphere. Didn't have any in the tropics, which is too bad. Um, it'd be nice to get some in the tropics to really fill this in and see what's going on here. Because we have these two clusters uh, of, of measurements, it kind of looks like the intersections are in two clusters, almost as if we have two suns. And I, I know I've heard, the, I, I've heard the, the alternative science people talk about multiple suns, uh, sure, but no, we don't have multiple suns. All you've got to do is, uh, you know, follow the sun through the tropics and then you'll see, no, it's the same thing. Um, this trend that we noticed where as we, we started south, the, um, the sun appeared to be here. And as we, we moved north, it moved up. It'll, it's going to hit a peak. Like if you were, if you were directly underneath the subsolar point, you're going to be looking straight up and you'll see that, yes, the sun is straight up here. And then as you continue further north beyond the subsolar point, it comes back down. So that's what we're seeing is that um, the, the, where the sun appears to be is lower the further south you get or the further north you get away from the subsolar point. And that indicates that this triangulation method just is not going to work. The first takeaway I want to stress here is anybody who told you that uh, the triangula triangulation method totally works um, was not giving you accurate information. This is what happens. This is what happens every time. We're not the first people to do this experiment. And, and I think you knew. I, I think the flat earthers out there mostly already knew this was what's going to happen. Um, it does not work. So what else? We have been told that the model, that the you know the spherical model, that 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 explains this. But we've also heard from the flat earthers that the flat model explains it just as well. Uh, and every single time someone does the flat Earth explanation, they showed you exactly two lines crossing 
or they did just one set of angles. They did 45 degrees. Samuel Robotham does this in his, in his Flat Earth pamphlet. He, he goes with this and he says that the sun is 3,000 miles up because of a single pair of crossing lines. We could pick a pair and we could pick any height for the sun we want. We've, we've seen here that we can pick heights anywhere from way down here where it's, you know, 1,500 kilometers above the earth up to over here where it's like 6,000 kilometers above the earth. Um, pick a pair. You could put the sun anywhere you want. Obviously, that is not reality. That is incorrect. So we now know that Samuel Robotham and anyone else who's gone through this exercise and tried to claim that the flat earth model works just as well for these solar observations, they were not telling the truth. Um, I am I am not going to go all the way to say they were deliberately lying. Maybe they didn't know any better. Maybe they'd never seen this done before. But now you have seen it. And now you know that those people are telling you things that are not truthful and are not reliable. You should not count on those people. Um, so on the other hand, suncalc.org uh, steered us right. Suncalc told us the truth. Um, and the, the flat earth hypothesis needs to go back to the drawing board. The, uh, of course, the Globers are going to want to conclude that this, this disproves the flat earth. The flat earth hypothesis has been nullified and we need to reject the, the flat earth. Um, maybe not yet. Okay, let's, let's take it all the way through. Um, are there any possible explanations that we have not looked into that can maybe resolve this. Uh, the original hypothesis was that the Earth is flat, the Earth is flat, and that the Sun is in a particular spot. Now we get a lot of, a, a lot of comments down in the, in the chat about the Sun is apparent, uh, the Sun is not physical, um, those kinds of comments. I've tried to make it clear before, let me say it again, that is irrelevant. Whether the sun is a physical object or simply an optical phenomenon, it needs to be in a, in a place. The optical phenomenon must appear to occur in a location. Um, uh, unless you, you have some hypothesis about how this, this optical illusion that is the sun moves depending on the observer's location. Uh, and I think that's where you're trying to go with this. So let's be clear. Don't just say it's not physical. That doesn't explain anything. Uh, don't say it's apparent. That doesn't explain anything. Um, you're looking at my image right now. That's not physical. It's apparent. But it's here. It's in a particular place on your computer screen or on your phone right now. That is an image. And we can make measurements about that image. This, we have an image of the sun and we used it to make measurements. Okay. So if you are going to suggest that the sun appears in different locations for different viewers, we're going to need some kind of model for why that would happen or how that would happen. We could use this now to describe how it, uh, how it happens. We don't have a why, but we do know that the sun appears to be somewhere over this Tropic of Cancer when you're under the Tropic of Cancer. And then as you get further away, the sun appears to be somewhere else. The easy way to go with this probably, and I've seen lots of comments on this, is refraction. The sun really is, say, uh, I'm going to say it looks like it's round about here somewhere. So it is directly above the subsolar point. And the further you get away from the subsolar point, the lower it appears to be. So maybe what we're saying is the sun is up here, t up here high on the subsolar point and the light is bent. The light is bent 
in an upward manner as it goes away, uh, as, it, as it goes away so that um, the sun appears to be lower than it really is. But certainly what we could do from this is we could build a model, we could build a mathematical model of how that bend takes place. And in fact, Walter Bislin has one. Walter Bislin has a, a geometric simulation, uh, a mathematical model of how the light must bend in order to achieve this effect. Um, so maybe go check that out. I think that's, that's where we will probably start. We'll talk about how much refraction is that um, and uh, whether we believe there is a mechanism that could create such, uh, such refraction. Before we get into that, I would like to discuss uh, briefly the way the scientific method is supposed to work. The hypothesis is that the sun circles over the Tropic of Cancer. The prediction is that if we look there, we will all see the sun at the same height above the Earth. And then our test is designed based on that and we conduct the test and then we look at the results and we found that hypothesis was false. We now need to change the hypothesis. Um, one, one of the premises of our hypothesis was wrong. Now, the obvious first premise to attack is the idea that the Earth is flat. The flatness of the Earth, if we changed that, we could fix this. And we'll get into that another day. Um, but obviously there are those among us who do not want to go there, at least not yet. So what else can we do? And this is a proper part of science. So what else could we look at to possibly save this hypothesis, to change the hypothesis so that it still works with the flat earth? Um, what we could do is we could say that maybe the sun is somewhere over the Tropic of Cancer but the light from the sun does not travel in a straight line from its actual location or from its apparent location down to the spot where the, the earth, but on the spot on the flat earth where the observer is. Uh, maybe the sun is really up here and the light comes down and bends so that by the time it hits the surface, it is coming in at this shallow angle. Um, okay, so We'll look at that next, I think. Um, I want you to think about if you're if you're wanting to believe that and you're also wanting to be a genuine scientist, then um, what you're going to want to do next is ask, what is that angle? How much is that angle? In what ways does that angle vary? And how much are you willing to accept um, in terms of the angle? So maybe answer both of those questions. At, at what point do I say that is too much refraction for me to believe? You know you've heard that from the other side. You've heard the call of refraction and here I am, I'm offering it to you. Hey, have refraction. There's your answer. The, maybe the water in the clouds causes the light from the sun to bend. How many degrees can we bend before Somebody says, that is just too much. I don't believe it. In the last video, we did some shout outs, but I didn't catch everybody. So let's fill those in now. We have a few more to do. These here, these are wonderful people who they're just regular people, just like you and me. And they went out, they took the time to go out and make this observation with us and share that data with us. Let's, uh, let's see who they were. We have SW12. We have someone who goes by the name of RHKGL. Now, uh, those are obviously not, not your real names. If you want to, down in the comments, say more about yourself, uh, I invite that and, and we'll continue, uh, continue with this discussion. Who else do we have? We have Jaden Stetson and Steven Meyer. This is a family group. Uh, it's a father and two sons who went out and did this as a family. It was Father's Day after all on the solstice this year. So uh, I, I did this with my own daughter and yeah, this is, this is great. See, this is what this, uh, this everyday science 
It's a fantastic way to spend time with your family and spread a little of that positive education that I think is so, so important. Um, so great job, Jaden, Stetson, and Steven. Who else do we have here? We have Tom, John Leviter, uh, David Penny, and Winston Wolf. All these are folks who went out and did this observation with us and contributed to this data set that you're gonna that that we just saw. Finally, one more shout out. I want to do a special shout out for for Michael Dam Olson, who has a YouTube channel that I missed on the previous time. Uh, we will take a quick look at this YouTube channel, and also I want to highlight in particular the this video. We'll take a look at that as well. This is Michael Dam Olson's YouTube channel, and you can see there's not a lot here yet but there is uh, the results of this observation appearing here on the YouTube channel. I will link this, this video down below um, and I won't show the whole thing, just show the highlights. So this is a wonderful animation. Doing, he's doing 3D animation on this thing and he's going to show our data set. This is that same data set that I just showed, but look how much higher quality his presentation is than what I did. So pop over there, give that a watch, give that a like, um, and uh, maybe that deserves a sub. Uh, we, we get some subs piling on there. Maybe Michael will make us some more videos of this data and we'll keep feeding him more data and keep that going and turn that into a really fantastic channel. So lovely to see that. Um, and everybody go check that out. Uh, thanks again for everyone who contributed on, in the next video we will look at the, the globe implications of this data set. Um, and Michael tells me he's already got the animation ready to go. So maybe you'll see it on his channel first. Okay, see you next time.